you were telling me about this uh, kind of continuation of a story that you're working on now. Hey, you wouldn't mind telling the students a little bit about what you're doing right now, this latest piece. <laughs> yeah. The reason why I kind of wrote until um, late last night, I this morning, is because just a couple of months ago, I went to Syria, where, as you all know, there is a war, a bloody war, a horrible one, and where a lot of my colleagues got beheaded, and where it's very difficult to go to nowadays because of kidnapping and violence and all that. And where I managed to go because um, there is an area in northern Syria um, where the Kurds, um, they make up like 10% of the Syrian population. They managed to create some cantons in the north where it's okay to go to. So you might have heard of a city called Kobani in northern Syria, where there was a huge, tremendous battle between the Islamic State and these Kurdish fighters. And after months of a tremendous war, at the end of January, they liberated, the Kurds liberated the center of Kobani. All of this to say that I went there, kind of crossed the border, Turks normally, you, you get into northern Syria by crossing the border with Turkey, to the border with Turkey, um, and the place was leveled, dressed up, World War II, and there were still bodies everywhere, and I fell in love with the Kurdish fighters who basically had an enormous role in liberating Kobani, I had no idea about this, but basically in the front lines, the Kurdish women, the fighters, were urulating. Yeah, you know, you heard these things. It's very interesting. They do the weddings, they do, they do it when they're happy, they do it in moments that are very meaningful. And so basically, the women were urulating in a very epic moment of the war to keep the last front line. And the ISIS fighters, they were thinking that they wouldn't go to paradise if they got killed by women on the front line. This is the way they actually kept Kobani, which I thought was a great anecdote. But when I was there, so, so what you're saying is that for an ISIS fighter to, to kill a woman in battle messes up their ideology and that they don't... No, it's, it's actually the opposite. It's like if an ISIS fighter gets killed by a woman uh -huh. in battle, so he won't go to paradise and get the 72 virgins and the milk in the hand and all that. The package will be missing, you know what I'm saying? So they actually kept Kobani because they had all these fighters and I fell in love with the women, da, 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 and so I came back and I wrote the story about this. But then, while I was actually there, and I'm getting to the point where I, I wrote up, up until late last night, but while I was there, I also got this Italian fighter. Like the Kurds came and they're like, no, we got an Italian fighter. Italian fighter? Italian fighter, the so, only one. So there's an Italian fighter fighting with them? With the Kurds, huh? against sizes. And so no Italian newspaper has ever managed to interview an Italian fighter who went to Syria to fight. So I got really interested. And so then there was this problem because finally I got the permission to interview the Italian fighter. And of course, the Italian fighter, you know, was on the front line. And so even to get to the front line was a different story because, you know, it's a war zone. And, um, and, and so, fantastic, great. We take pictures of the guy, the 25-year-old guy from St. Gallia, Chandri Sochali, leftist, atheist, was a great story. Then I come back, I write the story, and my editor is like, you know, but we need to do a follow-up and trying to figure out where this kid comes from, and could you interview the mother? And I called the mother, and of course the mother wants to interview me because she's really worried about the son, her son, because he's in Syria, and I just met him, he's like, where is my son, where is my son, and he did you have and my son, and can you tell me whether he's okay? He's like, I should be asking the questions, but I know it's sensitive, and so, you know, I talked to this woman for a few days, and I, and I write the story, and I said the story to my other king state, and then at midnight, the woman calls back, and he's like, my daughter in Florence didn't know about my son in Syria, and she had a heart attack, and she's now at the hospital, and please, 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 there is also an 82 year old uncle who doesn't know anything, and if you publish another you know, story, it's a disaster, you might die. I don't know what to say. So she asked you not to publish the story? She asked me not to publish the story. story, yeah. I didn't. I called the editor and I'm like, you can't run the story. He didn't like that, but he went along because I gave him an option. 
And um, yeah, she asked me for two weeks in a row to write this story. And I said, no, he waited. I said, I'll promise you to run everything and you know, we'll have to wait for the kid to come back. Of course, the kid comes back from Syria when I'm on a holiday in the Sinai this week. You know? So I'm there in the sun, bedroom, desert, wonderful life, finally. Message, what's up? Hi, I'm back. Because I know I have to write that story. So in my head, it kill me. You know, well, I'm on a holiday, so I don't do what I you know, promised him I was going to do. So this is why I, I was late yeah, last night, right? So you finally permitted to, to run the story on the, on the Italian uh, volunteer to the Kurds against ISIS. Follow up, yeah. And I just think it's an interesting note that your holiday was in the Sinai Peninsula. Everybody should go through all these countries who've been upset by, by revolutions because what happens is, yes, of course, the, 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 the biggest weapon of groups like ISIS is fear. By projecting fear, by intimidating us, they create more depression, more frustrations amongst the people, more frustration leads to nihilism, and the kids going to war zones. So, you know, it's okay to go to the South Sinai. The problems are 1,200 kilometers up north in North Sinai. South Sinai actually is wonderful. There are no, it's like right now there are no tourists outside. Right? It's incredibly cheap, and I would, I would like everybody to go, but everybody's scared, you know, because there is because they're very successful. These guys in projecting fear, and we're getting along, you know, by 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 playing their game, basically. Interesting. Uh, I know there are students here who are avid writers, and others who work in school newspaper or consider careers in journalism. Others who are thinking about maybe becoming photojournalists. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why you became a foreign correspondent and why you continue to do it? I figured that I wanted to write ever since I was eight, I think. And being from a, from a small place in southern Italy, I also figured pretty early that I wanted to get the hell out. And so I thought that combining my two passions, writing and getting the hell out, you know, I need to find someone who would pay for me writing and traveling. And so I thought, ah, oh, journalism might be feasible. That's what I need to do. And so how I got there then uh, is a different story. But, but the bottom line I think is that if you are driven by passion, then, then what you have to do is basically to figure out what is the career to which you can express it. Uh, and, and because only your passion can drive the sacrifice, you know, the, the, the fatigue, the work, the hard work that you need to put in to anything um, that is worth doing. These, these students here are ages around 14 to 19, and I, I just I know that eventually you attended uh, Columbia School of Journalism. I've got a picture up there for you, uh, which is a which is a graduate school in New York City. But I know you also had a very interesting uh, high school experience and uh, that between the ages of 14 and 19 you were doing uh, maybe not the normal pre-journalism thing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why I'm able to be a foreign correspondent is also because when I was 15, I, I always loved play, play volleyball. In school I was, I, was, I was jumping and doing all sorts of stuff that you kids said that I guess you do. So I was good at volleyball and then when I was 15 one summer, a, 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 a coach showed up and um, they asked my family if I could move to a different city because they wanted me to be a professional volleyball player. And at 15, at first my mother said, no, 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 no. And we spent the summer with my father saying, no, 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 no. And I said, yes, 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 yes. And then eventually, three months later, I moved to this city and then I, I started playing volleyball in Serie A A2, which is the second league in Italy. In Italy, you have Serie A1 and Serie A2. So I played volleyball. And it was great because it taught me discipline. It taught me um, how, how to be determined and how, how to focus and um, how to be healthy basically by pursuing um, a game but there was not only a game, you know, throughout these years you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do, and then only suddenly there was a ball and you could focus on that ball with, with, with you know, with the full range of energy and anger, whatever it is that you, that you carry with you as, as a teenager. Um, 
and that was great. But then I decided that I didn't want to be a sports, a, a, a volleyball, a sports person all my life. And then I played volleyball at 20 because I wanted to ride and wanted to find someone who paid for my travels. So you returned to university at slightly later age. So, no, really not. At university, I did. I enrolled. I, I mean, I stopped playing volleyball the moment I enrolled in university, and I realized that I couldn't do both because I could have done university, but it, I, I really wanted to focus on writing and I didn't have the time because I was practicing every day. And um, and if you want to do something different eventually, you, you have to something has, has got to be given up, basically, you know. And I never regretted it. Terrific. Uh, I have a question about being a woman. Uh, has that had any impact on your career? Have you ever experienced prejudice? And uh, do you feel like when you go to dangerous areas of the world, do you feel like being a woman has any impact on uh, the risks you take? Uh, Bigger risk? Are there things you face that your male colleagues don't have to go through? Um, yeah, I think we, we had uh, this conversation probably. There are a lot of stereotypes about women in the Middle East, which are true, like some stereotypes are absolutely true, but there are also things that only if you hang out long enough in a place you can find out. And what I found out is that being a woman in the Middle East actually helped me tremendously because um, I could get access to women my male colleagues wouldn't get, you know, and so, for example, in Afghanistan, the men who talk to me, because I'm, as one said, actually, you're half a man, what you're doing here, you should be home with your kids and your husband, and, you know, so I'm a half a man for an Afghan uh, man, but I still have access to the women who are normally kind of kept in, deep inside their homes, where no photographer and no male reporter would have access to. So I get access to both of them, and this is something that you know people don't, don't realize. Um, the other thing that I get when I'm traveling to different places is that men show, number one, appreciation, Muslim men show appreciation for a woman actually shows up in a place where mortars are falling, and, and so there is extra care, and there is the fact that they want to protect you. And, 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 and you know, these are very real moments and, and, and you appreciate that. And it's never been it's never been overwhelming. I'll give you an example. Ramadan, Syria, Northern Syria, civil war. I'm sleeping in a school, you know, on the floor with a bunch of fighters and Bashar al Assad is bombing all around Aleppo. It's Ramadan, and as you know, during Ramadan, it's fasting. It's the holy month of, of the Islamic faith, and they don't drink, nor eat, nor do anything else from dawn to Maghreb to, to sunset. You know, no food, no water, no nothing. And I'm there, and I'm the only woman, with a bunch of fighters and uh, a, a, a guy photographer, a male photographer. And there is one of these guys, who is a normal spirit, who wakes up, prays, comes to me with a coffee. He made coffee, you don't do that during Ramadan, right? You're fasting, you're, you're, you're not drinking, you're not eating. He made coffee for me, because he knew that I was... You know, if you're not Muslim and you're white, they assume you're Christian. I could be agnostic, they don't care I'm Christian. I'm born in Italy, I'm Catholic, by definition. This is a little bit of a problem, but it's a little bit... So, this guy, you know, he was offering me coffee to show appreciation. It's like, this is his faith, he's doing Ramadan, but I'm a Christian and I'm there and I'm, I, I'm entitled to my coffee in the morning, so I made it for him. You know what I mean? All of this kind so, of... Uh, so in many ways it seems like it's working in favor that you have access to okay. women in, in, in these places and some, sometimes maybe it's slightly better treatment. Yeah. Slightly. Although, although since you're sleeping on the floor of a, of a school, bombs falling all around, it's all kind of relative. Uh, yeah. I, I, prepared, I did prepare uh, this PowerPoint with some of, uh, some of the articles of yours that I found on the web and I just wanted to show it to the kids for a second. Uh, here, of course, is your magazine with a variety of different covers. Uh, here's a cover of... Uh, is that the gentleman you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, yeah, This is the guy, the Italian father, and that's Kobane on the left, where we made it. And this is the guy that I found in Kobane, actually in the village on the front line, um, in, at the end of January. And came back last week and um, I spent yesterday, yesterday right as I talking to him because he's back and actually this morning as we speak as I speak here he's questioning the police because he's actually for a fire. Wow yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. That's it.
that. Yeah, and this is one of the women, one of the women fighters I told you about in Kobana, is doing the Tbilisi on the front lines against the Islamic State. And these women, I was so impressed by them, really. And this is, this is again the Italian fighter on the right, with this most, and this is really funny, study. oh, every now and then these fighters, you know, they're kids, there's a, he's 25, I guess he's old, but he's actually, you know, he's pretty young, and he says, he can pop that on WhatsApp, and um, he sent me this picture, and he's like, do you know the gun um, uh, and I have in the picture um, is a Muslim from 42, and it has a silver hammer on it, like in the movie, like uh, the movie about Stanga or something. It's like, yeah, and I'm thinking, you watch too many movies, kid, okay, you know, just like, forget. And this is not, yeah, this is one of the girls who, this is actually, this was a moment, you know, they're, they're, when you go to a place like Syria, it's kind of epic, you know. Um, and when I went to this village, um, deep in the countryside, which was the front line between, uh, the EPG, the Kurdish guerrilla fights in Daesh, ISIS, the Islamic State, um, I found them, I found these girls. And it's 12 o'clock, right? It's noon. And there is light, we are in the middle of the day. I've never seen, uh, ten, 10 years of war reports in action, never saw anything quite like this. I'm arriving. And they're there, and there are women all over, they're so beautiful. And all of a sudden, they start dancing the Dapaka. The Dapaka is a very kind of typical dance in their world. So they're all together, men and, and, and women, and they go back and forth, and they sing, and they dance. And then someone had the fighter had a little radio, and they were playing this. And I thought, this is kind of cool. And then when they sat them, the kid that took us to the front line you know, on a. On a <laughs> It was not even a, a car, I don't know what it was, like it was something on four wheels moving. So the kid who took us to the front line, he must have been 17, I don't know. All of a sudden he starts working the mortar and starts firing mortar rounds. And I'm like, and he's using an 82 Chinese mortar. And, and I'm like, 82 millimeters, that's nothing. So I realized that ISIS is really close. And I'm like, this is no good. And they, these guys were dancing. The kid was firing the mortar rounds, 82 millimeters, and then very close. And I'm like, and all of a sudden I turn around and they, they, you know, just start running. And like, what the fuck did they do? <laughs> Why are they running like this? And then the commander is like, what? We're attacking the enemies. Like, what do you mean you're attacking the enemy in the middle of the day? Like, this is not. They're running. These guys just start running. In the middle of the field, they just start running. It's like the village is over there, night is over there. This is not good. Sure enough, the enemy starts, you know, our point fire means incoming fire, on a words, right? If you're shooting at someone, it's like the law of cause and consequences, you know? If you're shooting at someone, someone, you're shooting back. And I'm, uh, and I'm there. So I didn't like the idea. And, um, and they took the village in like two or three hours. Mortals were falling on us, of course. Um, yeah, it was that day. It was, it was a day, yeah. It was kind of a day, yeah. I can, I can skip my question about if you've ever had a dangerous experience. <laughs> Great story. Uh, this is from a, a more peaceful uh, setting, I think. Uh, this yeah. is a report of... Uh, Lanibela. This is Lanibela. This is Ethiopia. Okay, every night, my magazine, I write, I'm like the, the, the official weight of my magazine. My magazine kind of focuses on lifestyle, and we always have a celebrity on the cover. But I'm the official kind of uh, weight, you know, it's like, okay, my editor is like, yeah, 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 but we have her, you know, and we're sending her to all these places. So, but every year, for the Christmas uh, double issue, I do some kind of Christian story. And um, in Adibela, in, in Ethiopia, there is this place in the north, um, on the highlands of Ethiopia, it's a very beautiful place, um, where um, the Christians of the Lalibela church live. They call it the Jerusalem of Africa because it's a, it's a very beautiful place. They live in, the, the, there is this king in the 13th century who built 11 churches carved 
in rocks, in the rock, basically. They're, they're, they're stunning. And what people don't understand is that the problem with religion, and so, for example, the problem with Islam is not about the religion itself, but it's about modernity. At what stage of evolution anything can be, right? So, these Christians, in the year 2014, in La Libera, remote place, isolated place, they live pretty much the faith the way it used to be lived in the Middle Ages. And so, exorcist was there in the church. There was this woman jumping like this in the bridge with the holy water. You know, if kids don't go to church, the parents take them to the priest and they get tied up and uh, drowned with the holy water so the kid can get rid of the devil and go to church. I mean, all these kind of things. They're Christian, they're not Muslims, but it's about what they do in. Interesting. Interesting. And this is the cover of your book, Tahrir. I, I think uh, rather than comment on that, I'm going to open you know, the floor and see uh, what questions the students have. Uh, uh, just advice for aspiring international journalists. Get a good education, figure out what the best in your field, first of all, figure out what, what kind of field you was in. You can be a foreign correspondent, but you don't, you don't need necessarily to be a war correspondent. So figure out whether, what, what you want to cover. What is the thing that interests you the most? What is the thing that really captures your attention? What are the books that you could read all night long without getting tired? Okay. Just figure out what is your garden. What is the garden that you want to water every day? Once you figure out what's your garden, then you ask around, and, and if it's journalism, I mean, my school, the one where I went to New York was great, taught me a lot, so get a great education. But if you don't want to get a great education, just kind of read everything the best in your field. You know, it could be fashion, it could be art, yeah, could be war, it could be anything. Just read, start reading, sucking it up, and then move. If, if it's fashion, go you know, to Paris. If it's war, move to Beirut. Uh, it's, if it's the environment, uh, hang out in Sri Lanka. I don't know. But you need to move, you need to gamble, you need to take risks, you need to invest in yourself. And then eventually, slowly, but surely, things will happen. In the way that you, in the way that you dress, in the way that you act, is it, yeah, yeah. is it better for you to try to blend in or stand out when you? No, standing out is never a good idea, especially if people want to kidnap you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll invite them over for a party, no? Okay, so my policy is that if I go to Afghanistan, if I'm in Kabul, I wear a hijab, a scarf. If I'm outside of Afghanistan, if I'm outside of Kabul, I wear a burqa. And I know that some colleagues, including uh, the late Doriana Fallaci, the Salomania, like the other would say, um, had a different take. They were quite antagonistic and, you know, conflictual and polemic and all of that. But my humble opinion was stupid. You don't antagonize people in their home. You're trying to respect their culture. So, plus, on my account, as long as I'm concerned, it's a matter of security. If I want to go to Kandahar, where there is a wall, and you know they're kidnapping people, I do not want to advertise my movements, nor do I want to know what people, do I want people to know that I'm dead. Because the number one rule of going to dangerous places is that the less the people that know about my movements, the safer I am. So I have to kind of blend in, this is obvious. And um, I do that all the time, and I have no problems with that. I thought, yeah, yeah. Um, after Colombia, I got a job, um, uh, because only a sudden I dispense education, right? And it's a very provincial country. So if you get a fancy American education, then, you know, you're serious, you're a good candidate. It's like, what, the doors, they were really close to me on the side and they did open. Like, a couple of weeks after I graduated, I got a phone call from the legacy editor of a magazine in Italy. He got my phone number from Colonial University. And he's like, I want to do, I want to launch a new investigative section of this magazine and would you write for us? But then eventually I got, you know, in Italy there is this thing that is very kind of, uh, Anachronistic. You have this word because it doesn't make any sense, but there is something called the apprenticeship. If you want to be hired and be a journalist, you have to do it practicantato. It's this apprenticeship for 18 months. A company needs to hire you for you to become 
quote unquote, the journalists, of course they produce Himars, so they, they produce like this. But sorry, I'm a bit polite towards Italian journalists. But, um, so I did the apprenticeship, I did the Patricantato at La Repubblica Espresso for 18 months, and it was horrible because basically I realized what newsrooms in Italy were doing. They were keeping the young, talented people inside, stuck in the newsroom, paste, copy, editing, and pasting whatever the newswires were producing. And they were sensing outside, traveling, the old guys who would just kind of rewrite the same newswires that was reading, reading in the newsroom in a fancy five star hotel room, wherever, abroad. It was insane. So I'm like, this I don't want. I actually, I mean, for the adventure, I don't want to. It's like I felt like a postal worker. So I did the apprenticeship, and after 18 months, like the day it finished, I was really young and restless. The day I finished the apprenticeship, I went to the editor and she says, like, this is my letter, I resign. And he's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, I never felt that sad. Goodbye. I left and moved to Cairo. So it was a gamble. It's what I was talking about earlier. You, you need a certain point to, to really figure out what you want and gamble, and, but then really work really, really, really hard. Because at that point, um, you are basically on your own. So I moved to Cairo because 9-11 had happened, and I started freelancing, and I started studying Arabic, and I started investing in the Middle East. That was my garden. And then everything happened from there because at a certain point then I moved to, from Cairo to Beirut. I was living in Beirut and Israelis in Beirut back in 2006. It's really hard. And that was when my life changed because I got a phone call from the editor in chief of Vanity Fair. He knew that I was this Italian crazy woman based in Beirut. And he called and then everything changed. Just approximately how long do you stay in a country or a war zone to get a story? Like a year or a few weeks, a few months, how long do you stay there? No, uh, it pretty much depends, you know, it changes. Like in Kobane, I was only for a week. Um, you know, right now there is a huge crisis in advertising, the money is no longer what it used to be. So I used to be, lo the, 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 the days when I could stay a month in, in Afghanistan, for example, are gone. So now I'm going to talk. 10 days, maximum a couple of weeks, but then it depends on how long it takes to get a story. Sometimes you're just very lucky and things happen, bang, and you know, and then you're there for three days and you produce two stories. It varies, it varies. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Kelly.